principle of subsidiarity is basically this. Tasks should be done on the lowest level of society in which they can be done well. You can envision society or the political sphere as a series of levels getting successively larger, from the individual to the family to small companies, city states, and so on. The principle of subsidiarity says that if I have a task or decision to make, I should give it to the lowest level that can do this task well. It's like the old joke about how many people does it take to change a light bulb. You don't need the whole state to do a job that one individual can do well. Subsidiarity. The word subsidiarity comes from the Latin word subsidium. This word referred to the reserve troops in the Roman armies, units that sat behind the front lines and provided support where it was needed. Similarly, higher levels of government should sit back and allow lower levels of government to accomplish all the tasks that they can reasonably do, while providing support and reinforcement when needed. This has been a principle of Catholic social teaching since the earliest of the social encyclicals. Pius XI in 1931 wrote in Quadragesimo Anno that a community of a higher order should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order, depriving the latter of its functions, but rather should support it in case of need and help to coordinate its activities with the activities of the rest of society, always with a view to the common good. John Paul II quoted this in his social encyclical Centesimus Annus, and you can find that quote in the Catechism, number 1883. Pius XI says the same thing in that document later when he says, it is an injustice to assign to a greater and higher association what lesser and subordinate organizations can do. This is the principle of subsidiarity. Now, why does it make sense? How does this principle lead us to greater human fulfillment and greater relationship with God? First of all, subsidiarity protects us from tyrannical excesses of government. It opposes the natural tendency of those in power to seek to lord it over those beneath them. Remember the old adage, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Subsidiarity protects those in power from the corrupt tendency to interfere excessively in the communities and individuals they govern. Second, subsidiarity provides for more people to exercise their freedom. God created us in his image and placed us in the freedom of our own counsel. That's from Sirach. God intends us to be self-directed, to participate in those decisions that shape our lives, and God himself respects that freedom which he gave us. Subsidiarity ensures that local communities, individuals, and grassroots organizations can exercise that freedom to the greatest extent possible. Third, subsidiarity tends to make tasks more effective and efficient. It ensures that people close to the problem are directing resources, people who have greater local familiarity, who know the ground, who are aware of local history and culture, and who are motivated to solve the problem because it affects their daily lives. So subsidiarity helps to make things more efficient and effective. Finally, the principle of subsidiarity is good because it reflects the fact that governments exist for communities, for families, for individuals, not the other way around. Subsidiarity protects us from thinking that individuals and families are just cogs in a machine existing for the sake of the national GDP. So those are all reasons why it's good to leave tasks to the lowest possible level of government. Of course, at times local governments can be overrun and make it so that higher levels of society need to step in. The Compendium of Catholic Social Teachings says this, quote, Various circumstances may make it advisable that the state step in to supply certain functions. However, this may not continue any longer than is absolutely necessary since justification for such intervention is found only in the exceptional nature of the situation." End quote. In other words, if higher levels of government need to intervene in the affairs of local government, or if the government itself needs to intervene in the affairs of private citizens and local communities, they can, but only in exceptional circumstances and only as little as possible. That's the theory of the principle of subsidiarity. What does this look like in practice? We can see some obvious examples as we look around our society. The state doesn't tell you where to work, who to marry, how many children you can have. These are the decisions that can be made and should be made at the individual level. Another example is education. The family has the primary responsibility for educating their children. Parents choose how to raise their children, where they should go to school, and so forth. The state cannot force parents to make any one choice about this. Similarly, public health questions about lockdowns, masks, social distancing may require different answers in different local communities, different policies, for example, in New York City, versus rural Montana. Such decisions should be made as locally as possible. Of course, the principle of subsidiarity recognizes that some tasks, like the organization of the military, negotiation of foreign treaties, must be done at higher levels of government, but the presumption is always in favor of local solutions whenever possible. 
Let's apply this to a recent example. Should National Guard troops be sent into cities that have had large violent protests, like Portland or Kenosha? Subsidiarity means that the presumption should be no, since a community of a higher order, the federal or state government, should not interfere in the internal life of a community of a lower order, the city government of Kenosha or Portland, for example, because that would deprive the smaller community of its function to keep the peace. At the same time, subsidiarity does not exclude the possibility that the higher order community should support the smaller. If there's a case of need, does this constitute a sufficient case of need, a sufficiently exceptional circumstance, which would warrant state or federal interference? That's the question. But subsidiarity means that the presumption is against any sort of federal intervention. Similar cases abound. Consider the 2008 bailouts of GM, Chrysler, and of the certain Wall Street investment firms. Were these cases of sufficient need to warrant the federal government interfering in the internal life of the American market? One must show that the evidence demonstrates this. One can consider also the integration of schools in Arkansas in 1957 when President Eisenhower federalized the National Guard and directed them to assist the nine black students in their entry into the Little Rock High School. Was this justified in view of the principle of subsidiarity? Again, possibly. But one would need to explain whether this case represented sufficient need in exceptional circumstance where local levels of society were unable to respond adequately to the problem. These examples respond, reveal the challenge of applying the principle of subsidiarity in practice. One has to balance subsidiarity, which says leave lower levels of society alone, with solidarity, which says that all of us have responsibility for one another. If solidarity outweighs subsidiarity too much, we are left with a society of dependence and a welfare state. If subsidiarity outweighs solidarity too much, we are left with self-centered localism and a no-holds-barred capitalism that tramples on the poor. Let's summarize. The principle of subsidiarity states that decisions should be made on the lowest level of society at which they can be weighed well. This principle makes sense as a way of curbing authoritarian rule, promoting local freedom and creativity, ensuring efficiency, and keeping the priority of focus on people rather than on government. Subsidiarity can be difficult to apply in cases where it seems like local governments or companies are failing their citizens. In these cases, wisdom and prudence has to guide our decisions of whether to intervene, and any intervention should be as limited as possible. The principle of subsidiarity is one of the four key principles of Catholic social teaching, and it particularly resonates with us in the United States. As Americans, we are enthusiastic about the rights of individuals, rights of the family, states' rights, and the importance of local grassroots organizations. With the principle of subsidiarity, however, there also comes a personal challenge to each one of us. Specifically, it's a challenge to each of us to our individual responsibility and individual initiative. Subsidiarity puts the ball in our court. It means that the government is not going to do our jobs for us. These higher levels of society are to leave individuals and local communities with a space to act, to live out our God-given freedom. Whether we exercise our freedom and our creativity to take advantage of this opportunity is up to us.